Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for our final jury of the Masters Design and Make course. Um, we are very pleased that we uh, managed to come here to the mothership. Uh, it's been quite a journey to get us here. And our students will tell you all about the Tree and the Trust project, which is a project that's been going for the last 15 and a half months. Um, and that was set up, run together with the MSC course, and we're very happy to see some of the MSC students here as well. So this is a team project that explores phase three of Wakeford Hall. Um, Wakeford Hall is, is uh, a lovely complex building, and the conversations about it started in 2014 when Brett Steele uh, proposed an internal competition uh, within the AA community. Um, so this is phase three. We have built two parts already, and this is the extension into the lecture hall and into the offices. But these guys will tell you all about it. Um, did you want to add anything? Um, I guess just, I think that's really important that it's a, it's a kind of long-spanning, multi-generational, multi-generational, multi-cohort project that's gone through kind of iterations of one cohort handing the project on to another who interpret it and develop the next phase and hand it on to the other. Kind of unlike probably any project that's been done at Hook so far, is a, it is a kind of big collective project for the AA. Um, the students will explain, but they, they were also, it was a, a, a kind of full cohort project, essentially, um, together with the MSCs who have already graduated, as Manuel said. Um, and yeah, it will be ongoing. It's an amazing thing to create within the middle of Hook, a kind of a hub. It's, it's a focus point. Um, I like to say maybe it's kind of a living room that we're missing on campus somewhere to congregate, somewhere to show our stuff, showcase, hold exhibitions, events, gather, um, all the good things. Um, we should introduce some of the critics. Um, we, I mean, we've got critics we invited formally, ones we invited informally, students. Um, but we've got um, uh, Juro and Ivan from Diploma 21, that's right? Yep, got it. Um, <laughs> um, we've got Chris Pierce on the front row, Mike Weinstock. Um, we've ben, got Ben Hayes, Hayes sorry. Um, James Solly, who's one of our technical tutors. Um, who else are we missing? I think it, it's really important to add that uh, we brought the whole tribe. Yeah. So project managers and administrators, everyone from Hook Park kind of came down <laughs> to <laughs> celebrate, celebrate and support the team. Foresters. <laughs> Roboteers, everyone. So I think this, this is a really special um, celebration and discussion of the work. And um, maybe we should hand over to these guys. Yeah, I think we should stop talking. <laughs> okay, floor is all yours, guys. Well, good, good afternoon and welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here today with us for our final jury of the Master in Architecture of the Design and Make program. We are here to present our work and also a glimpse of Hook Park. But first, let's, let's introduce ourselves. My name is Rafa, I'm an architect, and I'm from Uruguay. <laughs> My name is Nikta. Uh, I'm also an architect, and I'm from India. Well, I'm Miguel, yes, also an architect, uh, but I'm from Peru. My name is Eileen, and I'm also an architect from China. <laughs> Well, this first presentation is an introduction to the Wakeford Hall project, as Kate and Emmanuel said, and the tree and the truss. A little reminder of where we are located. Some of you might not know, but our program is not based here in London. Hook Park is the Architectural Association's woodland in the southwest of England, in Dorset, a place far away from here but that now we call it home. And at Hook, we are all surrounded by forest. The, the project that we have been working on is situated on the center of the campus, 
where all the other main buildings uh, are located and where we spend the majority of the time in our daily life, uh, daily time. <laughs> the Way for Hall project will be a landmark for the academic and local community in Hook Park. And it is a project that has been evolving from generations before us, as Kate said. And the Wait for Hall building will become uh, the heart of the campus. This will be the living room of Hook Park, where the students, staff, visitors, and all the local community gather together, collaborate, and share the space for lectures, exhibitions, and other fun activities. Um, being surrounded by forests keeps us embedded in nature always, and after all, we also become part of the ecosystem of the forest at, at Hook. One important thing to mention about this project is the building process. As this building is so important for the AA community, it has been developed in several stages. Given its scale and future use, a lot of time and effort has been invested to craft it with care. This is not a mere prototype or an experimental endeavor. It is a space that we will, we will build and inhabit by the community of Hook. The whole building has a pre-approved planning permission, and as you can see, a fragment of the project has already been built. The process for building Wait for Hold has been long. In 2016, Design and Make students got the chance to design and build the first part of the proposed building structure. Their objective was to research and explore the, the manufacturing process of a glue laminated mega structure that could hold a very strong tension forces. And this skeleton marks the beginning of the physically built wake for hold journey. Just around the corner in 2018, another design and make cohort engaged back into designing and building an envelope for the previous made skeleton. And this marks the initial transformation of the original building proposal showcasing the ongoing evolution and adaptation of ideas from different students and cohorts. So this is how the site looked back in 2022 when we arrived to Hook Park. Uh, you can see the existing building and a big footprint uh, waiting to be developed. We took up the challenge of proposing the primary structure for the remaining section of the project. And when I say we, is us, but also the MSc students that are here with us or in their countries. And we understood that we had to align with the approved proposal. And most importantly, we wanted to use locally sourced available materials in line with the allocated budget. Uh, and the area that we have to intervene is of uh, approximately 320 square meters. The program for the whole building is organized with a big central space that accommodates a spacious lecture hall situated in between a volume of offices and other utilities and uh, a volume of studio. This also marks clear indoors-outdoors relationships and fosters like a vibrant connection with the yard that is right next to the building. Which gave us enough information to start making a proposal that could highlight these relationships and hier hierarchies between spaces, uh, like the double height lecture hall space and an open office plan for the future evolution of the admin area. That's a picture of us uh, after the, in the first test assembly of Axis uh, that we assembled at Hook. Um, so we started as a group of 11 students involved in the project, seven MSCs and four MRCs. And as you see, some of them are joining us here today. Shout out to all the Hookies in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I loved them, but it was not an easy task. <laughs> we had different opinions, viewpoints, we talked, we discussed, and we understood the place, the people, the forest, the Hook Park culture. And in the end, we made it work. 
We made a lot of initial models and preliminary prototypes to analyze different spatial configuration scenarios and ways of connecting a tree column with trusses. So we began with small scale models, gradually increasing the resolution of working with them to one-on-one -on -one prototypes. Uh, you can see some of them with us right now, but they're in the back in there. <laughs> um, so then we were presented with the opportunity to exhibit our ongoing research at the Royal Academy Summer Show uh, to, in 2023. So this motivated us to build the first full-scale prototype of the tree and the truss, accelerating our research and production. With this experience in learning, we established some key aspects for the project. More than mere objectives, these became the guidelines to further push the research, the testing, respect for the environment, and to innovate from the industry standard construction options. We agreed upon one proposed section to pursue these objectives and push the design further. Uh, we thought an axial structure was the most appropriate solution to cover the large spans and transition transitions through the different heights. So we wanted this axial structure to serve as a flexible system to accommodate different lengths and scenarios. And eventually the building space will be conformed by a five axis structural skeleton, the optimal number required to meet the project spatial requirement. Well, so in, sorry. so in parallel, we were learning about forestry and wood construction. And for example, to give some perspective about it, approximately only 30, uh, only 37% of a tree is utilized as lumber. And this is con concentrated in the tree trunk. The other pieces are mostly discussed, discarded. Uh, with that say, it's clear why our approach focus around utilizing resources available in the forest, aligning with the forest planning decisions. Hook Park has a total of 13 main compartments, many sub-compartments, and almost more than 15 species of different, uh, in different growth stages. So in our time, uh, in our time for thinking about the project, we had access to these specific species, or some of them, uh, from various sources at Hook, uh, from previously failed logs, uh, pre-season some timber, and even custom selection harvest uh, on time. So we, we knew that these were our options and we worked with them. So now, if we go back to the system logic that we wanted to, to achieve, uh, we, jump into, we jump from the wireframe to the physical production of elements. Applying all that we learned from the prototypes and from all the discussion, um, we define a family of components, of main components that, that will create a modular system. These are the stand base, a fork column, a glue lamp component, and a truss cords with web members, of course. Also within this, uh, and to put everything together, we define a variety of joints and connections. Each of them were carefully prototyped and tested to ensure its proper performance. Maybe the most important aspect for the project was to add value to these typically discarded elements uh, of a tree and to further push the inherited techniques and manufacturing process passes down to the, to those, from those before us in Hook Park. We choose between, different, between softwood and hardwood based on the element type and their structural requirements. We use different wood species like cedar for stamps, beech for forks and truss webs, Norway spruce for glue lamp components and truss cords, and ash for cord inserts, dowels and wedges. The result is a sophisticated structural system crafted exclusively from wood that uses only locally sourced timber from Hook Park. In this way, Design and Make opens a window for further research into wood construction, expanding beyond conventional industry standards. As you can see now, this is how we ambition our proposal of five axes uh, structural system on site. But we will talk about that later today. Uh, now 
we invite you all to see more closely the initial prototypes and maybe pick a postcard from the prototype section. But thank you. OK, hello, everyone. I'm Yiling. Uh, this timeline chart concludes my learning over the year, and including team and personal work. In team one, turn one, we learned about woodworking and uh, worked in three teams to design and make three tables. I think this sparked my interest in the furniture design. And in the second term, we discussed the structure design of the Wayford Hall, and my classmates covered the process of designing of the triad trust in the previous part of the presentation. So what I'm going to talk about the next is more about my ideas that germinated during the production and the design process. Um, my design is more about my idea. Uh, my design aims to simulate the community through the furniture-related design. And my ideas were burst when working in the overall team and things system about uh, in the August, I have been focusing on my personal thinking and design. I named my project Resporting a word Derived from nature, which is full of our imaginings, our figure and renewal, um, coinciding with my thing, I think. <clears throat> so, um, when the autumn arrives, the leaves fly in the forest. We can capture in the swelling and uh, four turning forms of the falling leaves, produce the first part of the inspiration for the built-in furniture. And uh, thinking about more functionality of the tree fork clumps in the process of tree and truss structure manufacturing used, I named it as falling leaves. Mm. Falling leaves try to copy the natural geometry of a tree trunk for embedding which can be opened and closed. Mm, due to the distance of the tree and truss structure, it is investigated to open and uh, close it several times from 90 degree to 180 degree. We can extend the length of the furniture and uh, I think it can bring more possibilities to the functionality of the furniture. So next was an attempt at phototype production by translating the leaf form to find the built-in form. Um, here is my notebook to show how to find the shape and uh, and then adjusting the closing lock form according to the built-in form. Um, cutting the original trunk using the CNC machine and uh, copy the geometry by cutting the glued wood for placement. Um, I also use the CNC to cut to make the geometry of the lock. And uh, here you can see the GIF to show how to open and close. Um, after a series of design thoughts about how to rotate it, the choice was made to go with mental hinges. After that, I tried to express the furniture with more materials. So I tried to do the 3D paint of the model of the lock. Uh, but I found that the shape did not match the photo type. Mm, I think there is still some error between the digital model and the actual production. So to produce the design, you need to learn to keep track of the error during the production, as well as adjust the design according to the production. I think it's very important. Uh, this is what I learned when making this phototype. 
And uh, finally, this picture shows the whole ideas about the falling leaves put in a scenario of use in the wayfold hall. Due to the different geometry of the tree clumps, different heights and size can be chosen to place the falling leaves in. Due to the different, naturally, there will be a different function of the use of the falling leaves. The falling leaves can be a standing table, a seat, a shelf, and so on. And I think more people will use it in attempt to strengthen the community attributes of the way photo. Um, to be honest, the uh, phototype um, I made couldn't even take my weight. As a matter of fact, the joint, the metal hinge, uh, broke the first time when I sat on it. So how to make it rotate and uh, become a real piece of furniture in the Wayford Hall. I think I ne need more serious design and uh, exploration in the future. Um, <clears throat> so next part of my project, researching was inspired by the fabrics on used materials, capturing uh, captured during the production of the tree and truss. We can find some branches and uh, stumps left behind when we falling down the trees and uh, find some discarded board trunks and so on. So thinking about redesigning activities through these materials and uh, placing the activities back in the lecture hall of the Wakefield Hall and try to allow in or a student who come to Hawk Park to design a chair of their own, utilizing the existing unused materials and making them have a new life. So I try to be the first one to experience the activity and uh, start Yiling's chair design and uh, production used some existing unused materials. Mm. The topic of my chair design is not only a chair, and it's inspired by the nature forest. Um, the chairs are pieces of furniture that uses the unused branches, stumps from the forest. And the design logic is to cut, break down, reorganize, and uh, transforming to create some multiple forms. So the first chair I named it Wind 4, which was Brown when branches fall on the ground in attempt to learn about nature. The first step is to break down and reorganize one branch to create two different forms of the chair. As far as possible, use all pieces of the branch. One form I think is standing alone, which can be a chair or a shelf. Uh, reorganize geometry forms and uh, triangular truss uh, acres. And the other form is a tree clamp that can be used by attaching it to the trunk of a tree, which is made possible by the design of a adjustable joints that allow it to be used on trunks of different size. And uh, this is a model of adjustable joints design. It can move. Mm. This is an explode view of the first form, which shows more clearly where the different branches were used and uh, how they were assembled into the standing form. And on the right is a full view of the standing form. In the design and uh, production process, I also use some steroid to connect the each branches and use one 
uh, sliced stump and one unused wood board for the chair top for the other leg of the chair. Mm. This picture shows how the second form is used. When I use the central triangle as a clamp um, around the trunk and uh, tighten it so it can clamp to the trunk for existence, the so adjustable size allows it to fit a wider variety of trunk size. And uh, this design idea also comes from the previous falling leaves. I hope to make full use of the tree trunk clumps and uh, put in some interesting furniture points to enhance the vitality of the whole space. Here are some pictures to show the windfall in the nature and we can see the nature from the chair's gap. This photo shows more usage scenarios in fashion. I think windfall is not only a chair. And the second chair I named it for cutting, which was born when falling down trees in attempt to honor nature. First of all, I try to capture some gap geometry from the nature forest and applying it to form cutting gaps transformation of the stumps. I try to think of the new roles for these gaps and try to give the new life to the function of the stump. Um, here are some diagrams about the design and the production process. The size and the shape of the gap need to be precisely sought out in order to facilitate cutting, as well as the placement of the functions. So I start making. Here is a making flow and uh, we can see the full views of the four cutting photo type. Uh, this page is also the making flow and I try to take the cut pieces out and uh, combine them with some other materials like the resin. And uh, from the different views to show, you can imagine it as a decoration or as a candlestick. I think what it is, is entirely up to you and me. Mm. This page are some pictures to show the four cutting chair in the forest. And uh, here are some pictures to let you imagine more what it can be. Okay. Uh, let us going back to the activity of designing the chairs from unused materials. We could hold it in the lecture hall and give each a student who come to Hope Park the opportunity to look for more and different unused materials and think about designing them so that the students can design their own chairs and every chair named after each student. And each chair can kept in the lecture hall according to a survivable life cycle, like each chair is preserved in the lecture hall according to a viable life cycle. It's like an art exhibition. So that when the students return Hawk Park, they can still use their own chair in the Wayford Hall. I think this newly designed chair also have a life cycle. And after a while, they may also become unused materials that can be reused, redesigned, and recycled in a continuous cycle of design regeneration. As a, 
as the chair community cycles from one generation to the next. Um, I think this is a sustainable activity, economical and environmentally friendly, and uh, unique to our Hope Park. Uh, this picture also shows more of my ideas about more design of recycling materials. Um, after thinking this, I re explore to find more unused materials in Hulk Park. Um, this time I find more flexibility which materials may have been a leaf a few years ago and I try to give them a new life with new combinations and uh, translations. Uh, this is the first design. I found the glue lamp phototype from the before and some unused wood leg. Um, this leg, may, it may be a shelf before, I don't know. And uh, when we use the CNC machine to cut, we will use like this type of wood board to be a bait and I think this materials is also can use. And I also found some tension belt. Maybe we can give this all materials a new life. I recognize them into a larger piece of furniture. You can imagine it is a chair and also can imagine it is a table. Um, and use the tension belt to connect them is a flexible way. Here is a second design use some colorful water pipe. Due to it is a soft materials, I try to think to put some wood chips and some glue to make it harder. And I also found some wood board can be used and some metal clips can hold the water pipe. And finally, I design it like this, it looks like a normal chair, but use the water pipes to do the chair surface. And uh, this is a third design. I think we can cut and open the unused tree trunk in the hog pub and uh, make it have the function. I also found some fabric bricks and soil, uh, cutting the trunk shape and uh, combining them. I found it also can look like a chair. Up to this point, I think designing and making a chair is a job that anyone can imagine and uh, accomplish. They just need a chance. And I think design is an exciting activity, especially if you can product something. So in the end, I designed a poster for the event. It was maybe a four day trip about design and making your own chair in Hulk Park in Wayford Hall. And hope, hopefully this event will make the whole Hulk community more vibrant. Um, that's all. Thank you. Enjo I enjoyed very much your, your presentation. It sits somewhere between um, kind of craft fur furniture, art objects, and, it, it, and a sort of um, woodland-based bricolage. So some kind of framework like that would help other people to understand why you do these things. So it's very personal and I appreciate that and you're, you're very open and honest about that. But, but as, a, as an MRC, I think you need you know, a framework to relate it to other things. I think the falling leaves is great I'm not surprised it didn't work because that seemed quite obvious that it wouldn't. However, if you had looked at um, there's a little history of furniture 
like drop leaf tables and so forth, that have their structural support as part of the, what folds out. So, you know, if it, it's a single prop at the end of that, it, you would be able to sit on it and there'd be less stress on the, on, on the joint and there'd be no deflection because it's propped. So some note about how that could be developed in the future by other people would be uh, give it a kind of more completeness than, than maybe it does at the moment. Uh, I think the same kind of comment applies to making furniture or sculptural furniture because it's both a sculpture or it seems to be both a sculpt found sculpture and um, a usable thing when you when you talk about the the furniture that's going, you know, from your found pieces. Um, there's a level of resolution that they exist as ideas very well, but there's a level of resolution that I think, um, I don't know how much time we have, a few days? Yes. Only a few days. So you, it would be good to spend those few days making strong suggestions of how this could be resolved if someone else was, was to take it on. Because it, in the end, your best position is, is a kind of, this is a proposition. These are the ways to go about things that, that you can do. And this is a guide to what you will need to resolve in the future. And I think that, that would position it a lot, a lot more clearly for you. So, um, thank you for, it, it's really nice to, to see your kind of thought process of finding objects um, and that phrase at the beginning, kind of letting nature inspire you. I, I completely agree. I think that a, a framework, almost a kind of pattern book, might be a way in which you pack, pack this together, um, which is kind of setting a... There's clearly some parameters you've been working to, which some have communicated and some, I think some just need to be more defined. Um, how objects might be found, what type of objects might be found. And I think the, the, the main point on that is um, how you respond to them. And I think there's, there's, a, there's points where you've responded to the things that you've, you've found. And there's points where then you've kind of applied things onto those things you've found, which some work and some don't work so well. And that might be uh, the metal work in which you've, you've put in where the, the, the hinge, the folding hinge, could have that, could that been done with a prop or, or, or a timber joint or the, the, the threaded steel you have on the, the stool is there a way in which you, you're, you're inspired by the, 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 the timber you found and then you use the structural kind of accolades of that piece to then help define it. And that might be something which you can kind of wrap up and include in this, this framework or this pattern book where you're, you're, you're guiding how one might find an object and then use the parameters of that object to almost define what it is rather than applying it um, and, and forcing it to do something it might not want to do. Um, but yeah. Hey, hi there. Um, I l love the idea of making chairs. It's actually, it's strange, but that's something that seems to have sits very closely with our unit. We, we use it as a way of kind of understanding our, our environment. We go out, we find things, and then we try to sort of make them into something we can use. Yeah. And those things are sculptural sometimes. They're not very practical. Sometimes they fall apart, but they, all those things connect us to the place around us and they, you know they allow us to sit there and, and have a different relationship to it so as a way of understanding Hook Park and connecting to it it's a really really nice way to do that and I also think the idea of making a chair for I'm imagining this is the public this poster yeah like yeah. it's it's a really fundamental thing if you haven't done it you know like we've all sat on a crate but to consciously and intentionally make something that you then calling a chair. That's kind of a really, one of the most fundamental bits of design you could do. Um, but from what I can see in the, in your presentation, there's the idea of the public doing this, but I can't see any kind of 
further work on how that actually works. Because working with people in, uh, in workshopping is actually quite the complex thing to do. There's a real skill to making that work with people. You know, mm. it's hard, mm. actually. Um, that's, that's an art in itself. Um, whilst it's a great poster for a workshop, it would be really great. I don't know whether there's time or... Um, but to, for me to understand more how the workshop might work, this comes maybe something you could do, but also to see maybe some examples of the workshop working in some, some sort of way, in maybe simple form. I mean, I don't know what you provide, you know, what the course is through the, through the workshop, what the progress for it is, is it all realising one day? Because actually, to produce a, like a complex chair takes a while. I mean, I'm sure your chairs have taken a long time to sort of realise and, and, and put together. So, you know, whether you're providing a kit of parts or whether it's a set of instructions, um, like what level of support you give to this workshop, you know, or how open you are to sort of failure, you know, and kind of what's those criteria for success and fun. And, you know, maybe just we're all going to have a great time, but I'd like to maybe see that in a little bit more detail. Because I think... A, a poster is the easiest part of putting on a workshop, mm. in a sense. But I love the idea. Thank you so much. We continue, um, but we welcome those who just joined us. Um, we're going to focus now in the, into the second part of, of the initial intro of the Tree and the Trust, more detail about the making. Um, First, we wanted to mention some key aspects of this. Um, at the core of the design and make lies a deep-rooted bond with nature, and our design approach starts from the forest that surround our campus. Our education is continuously uh, it's a continuous conversation with the wood uh, as a material itself, uh, where the engagement emerged organically. Our approach focuses around utilizing resources available in our woodland aligning with the forestry planning. And combining this with the technological tools that are available to us. Our main aim was to try to uh, and resolve every aspect and connection of the structure only with wood. And that's all this timber, uh, and that all this timber uh, should be extracted from Hook Park itself. Working with the locally sourced natural materials without strictly depending on industrialized material options was vital for us. It's important to leave clear that we design with nature without forcing or manipulating it too much. Previously built design and make projects reflect knowledge transfer with every element and connection serving as a means of accumulated research and investigation. And as we mentioned before, the Wait for Hall project will be a landmark for the academic and local community in Hook Park. It's going to be a space for learning. We envision not just a lecture hall, but also a living repository of knowledge, a material library where information is not only stored in books, but also embedded within the very essence of the wooden structure. At Hook Park, our design process is shaped by learning and allowing the materials we engage with influ to influence our work. We actively cultivate collaboration with experts, tutors, and experienced fabricators. Collaboration becomes essential as our cohort is a team of individuals with different strengths, expertise that operates as a practice, striving for a common objective from crafting prototypes to testing, rehearsing, and refining workflows. We hope for this collaborative process, a fusion of unique skills and perspectives that we have adapted as a cohort continue to reflect in this new central space of Hook Park. So we saw in the introductory presentation a bit of the context and design process for the tree and the truss. This is a quick review on what we already explained earlier. Uh, this is the proposed five-axis structure and its main components. These components and pieces uh, are the ones that you can see around us, uh, mostly in this part of the, the room. These are actually the final way for whole building uh, pieces or structural elements. 
Some of them. <laughs> Some of them, of course. <laughs> Just the ones that fit through the door. Um, well, and all together with them, we also established a family of connection elements that allowed, of course, all of these to work and function as needed. So this presentation focuses on the, fact, the manufacturing process of the final version of these bespoke elements. Yet, it's essential to acknowledge the journey, the numerous prototypes, the test, the experience. So please feel free to have a look into the photo wall all around us in the back that captures that, the good, the bad, the ugly, all these beautiful aspects of our process. Yeah, we obtain the project's material directly from our woodland and make an effort to maximize the use of each felled tree in order to decrease wastage. There are two main ways of making use of wood from the tree, in its natural state or with the sawmill. Our objective is to optimize the use of round wood in construction through the application of technology and resources, putting in value elements that are often discarded by industry, and under understanding the natural shapes to enhance the potential uh, with the technological tools that we have available in Hook Park. Through dialogue with the sawmill operator, we discovered ways to refine the cutting list for the project, ensuring the optimal use of the tree trunk and improving efficiency by adapting certain design decisions. The stump base was implemented to establish a connection with the ground for the beech column, as cedar is more resilient species of wood. Striving to minimize waste through the process, we employed technological tools to optimize the timber sourced from our project. After a preliminary selection of cedar stumps, we used photogrammetry to scan and digitally determine the optimal position within the organic form. For precise connection with the fork column, around like 60 to 70 pictures were taken to scan the cedar stump. Benefiting from the design and make programs research and development in robotic machining, we employed the robot as a tool to achieve optimal precision in manufacturing the component. Seeking inspiration from Japanese joinery for our wood exclusive design, we utilize scarf joints for a linear connection with the fork column. So a series of scarf joints were tested uh, initially at one is to five scale, and then they were and we developed some further prototypes. And our first prototype was of the RA summer show. And finally, that's the stump. Uh, during RA prototype installation, we identified the necessity for a locator to assemble the four column on site onto the stump base. So we added a key into the stump base to locate the scarf joint and to guide the fork during the assembly. Um, so we then developed a fork family. So using digital tools, we derived the ideal three-point line diagram for potential forks um, to be used for the five-axis structure. So later we collaborated with our forester to handpick 10 fork columns for the project. And we collect collectively assigned a name to each fork to just imbue them with a sense of life. Mm -hmm. And, <coughs> <coughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can help you a little bit. <clears throat> yeah, th there have been intense days and we <laughs> have been sick. Like first me, now Snigda, so Miguel is the next one. <laughs> it's fun, like, <laughs> maybe Yiling is already coughing, so already in the... <laughs> but yeah, we use the robot for precise manufacturing between the four columns, thumb base, and the glue lamp. And due to the limited reach of the KUKA robot's arm, we had to operate in two different positions on the trolley. Uh, one for machining the connection with the stamp base, and the other one uh, for machining the, sc the scarf joints that connect to the glue lamp. Uh, so we also created study models using the CNC machine to investigate the connection between organic and standardized timber. While manufacturing our RA prototype, 
we identified the need to optimize the tool change for robot machining. And consequently, we chose to manually refine the connection with the, with the glue lamp. And that's what we can see on the screen. Seeking precision in the fit with the glue lamp components after the rough cuts by the robot, we employed jigs to route and machine a customized fit. Well, there it comes back, Snigda. <laughs> Are you better? <laughs> So in our final interaction of the four column, we introduced uh, a key, as Nigda said before, to locate the glue lamp onto the four column for easy install. And the relief cut was also used as a guide for the wood to release its retained water as we used a green wood a recently harvested from the forest for the forks. So now we are gonna start explaining the glue lamp component. The, the glue lamp piece serves as a negotiator between the tree and the truss, and its geometry follows the center lines of the fork, reinforcing the inherent shape of it. In our determination of using available resources, we need to manipulate some of the pieces, creating engineered timber that responds to specific internal forces and geometries. In the case of the fork, we use it in its natural state, and this, the glue lamp, is totally an engineered piece uh, designed by, by us. Uh, we developed these elements in line with the glue lamp design uh, language of Wake for Hall's phase one project. And while they may not be conventional glue lamp components, because it's a mixture between CLT and glue lamp, uh, they fulfill like, the necessary structural requirements. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we employed Norway spruce, uh, sun, and kiln dried. We have a kiln also in, in hook. In order to achieve like the optimal moisture content that we needed, that was below 20%, the ideal, but we actually worked with around 14. Uh, so to achieve the final result uh, of the glue lamp, a combination of two key processes is needed. First, the glue up, and then a precision CNC milling. The glue lamp is composed of a total of five layers of 22 thick uh, softwood planks. And throughout the, the structural decision making and the formulation of the laminated plank plans, we received continuous guidance and feedback from Arup. So thank you, Francis and all the team that some of them are here today, Annabelle, or yeah, I don't know where Francis is now. No. Ah, there, okay. <laughs> So the glue up is a very collaborative process where several of us work together to assemble the glued pieces and apply clamps. And all of this process has to be in under 30 minutes. So we first do a rehearsal and then we actually do the, the final one. And to do this effectively, um, like this preparation ensures a smooth and successful output outcome. So it's really important. And then it is dried overnight and ready to enter the CNC machine. The CNC process that you can see on the screen involves several runs using different codes and routing bits. Uh, and the main goal of this is to shape the outline of the glue lamp and create the distinctive wavy joints that connect the glue lamp to the truss cords that you can see it over there. In the, well, where's the glue there. lamp? Ah, it's in the floor. <laughs> well, you can stand up later <laughs> and see it. Um, so the shape of the glue lamp was conditioned by the angles of the fork openness, that in each case was different, and the height of the branched trusses that throughout the lecture hall, as we said earlier, the height uh, changes. And this is why some, some of them resemble giraffes, as the one of the screen that now is off, that one. <laughs> and other ones are like more petite, like the one that we have on the ground. Um, and we have, we have to be particularly mindful of the plank deviation as well uh, in the tension members. Uh, the, the bit that you see in the top left with the gray arrow was a very important tension member because it had to with, withstand uh, 10 loads uh, 10 tons of load, so it, it was critical to not uh, change so much the plank deviation in that member. 
And you all may be asking why I mentioned this of the plank deviation, but to enhance the cutting, uh, the cutting efficiency, we opted to minimize the amount of directions of planks in the glue lamp. So we had one horizontal, one vertical, and one uh, diagonal. And also in the prototype that we have there in the floor, you can see that, that uh, the planks not, not perfectly follow the, the direction of, of the member. Sometimes they are like a little bit, yeah, like the fiber orientation. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, and next. For the webs of the truss, we used small beach branches, branches embracing its natural shapes and aiming to make the most of the felt trees. Each piece was first scanned through photogrammetry and then the robot precisely cut it to fit the truss cords precisely. And this process exemplifies the knowledge transfer in design and make projects where timber in compression has been used a lot. And in total, we have 54 compression webs uh, throughout the, all the trusses of the five axes. And building on the knowledge inherited from the field station and taking it a step further in our project as each of them varies in angle and length. And it's super nice to make use of these small branches and highlight their inherent uh, strength by incorporating them as, as web members and also because it gives like a unique character when you see them in the building. Following with the web members, we want uh, them to display the building's main structural forces and the elements and the elements to evidence the ideas. So we complement the compression web solution with a bespoke tension web design. We actually have some of them here. That's the tension one, and the other one, the compression that could go around as well. <laughs> This is a sample of each type of web member. So please pass this around and, and have a better understanding of their natural qualities and, and beauties. So obviously this came from an evolution of prototypes that put to test the manufacturing process until we got a particular set of steps that managed to maintain the integrity of the wood while achieving the necessary shape to be held in position, specifically for the tension web. After this, uh, we were able to define 38 different length uh, pieces in four different groups of thickness, depending on the structural needs, of course, but following the same manufacturing process. The process for making tension web was the most laborious in terms of manual workflows, but also the most enjoyable when we work collaboratively with visitors. We wanted to create a beautiful object that retains the strength of the hardwood, of the hardwood fibers along the length of the piece. So we plane it and we steam it and we insert wedges to increase, to increase the area of the tips without breaking the fiber continuity. This level of exploration and innovation can only be supported and approved by our team of engineer advisors here present by doing a lot of testing. For this particular element and connection to the truss cords, we break a lot of wood and some testing equipment as well. The result is a strong element that evidences the hard work and perseverance of some of our team members. <laughs> Now, for the trust course, um, it's important to say that they play an important role to hold all these uh, different web members together with their unique angles, um, and they also allow us to reach the desired spams for the building, even when we have a five meter capacity length restriction in our sawmilling hook park. Uh, they are 95 unique pieces that need to be processed to a specific length and later a specific machining coding. Uh, not to get crazy with this uh, manufacturing process, we develop a coding language to identify each truss cord element. 
This was then translated into a number coding for easy making of physical pieces and to have a clear control over the digital file system. You can see more of this in the more detail in the manual that you have with you. So we pursued many different prototypes, combining ideas and shapes, uh, shapes. But the only way to be sure this idea work was once more through more testing and more breaking. This allowed us to select the best results and move forward into addressing the only wood structure that we wanted. Here's a, a, an example of all the elements that compose one truss, the A3 to be more specific. This will hold the web members in place with doubles and wedges, as you can see in the, in the trusses that we brought with us today. Let's make a special mention uh, to the hardwood insert. This was an innovative solution that helps specifically tension web members that reach up, up to five tons of force. The hardwood fibers resist the cross grain compression and prevent crushing from the high forces. For you to get a better idea of why this is necessary, the cross section of the truss where the, we include this hardwood insert is 10, 10 tons of force. So this is a very good example of synergy between different types of species of wood. Having, having presented uh, you all this, our family of components, uh, this is how they look in position. So after the rest of the team completed and left Hook Park, we pushed the production of the remaining components further to be able to pre-install two axes in place and have a better understanding of the different components collectively as a system. This is part of the learning in Hook Park. We take note of their behavior and then we digitally scan them and move forward. So this is the step one. So as first step for final assembly, it's important to mention that the five axes are supported only by the stump bases of the pile foundations and into the existing structure where it's leaning over. The final details of these connections are still pending and need to be approved by our amazing engineering advisors. The foundations have already been installed on site um, and after securing the stump base in position and its right orientation, the four columns are ins installed, and that's no hard work. Thanks to the keys we introduced, uh, it simplifies the process of assembly, and so they locate almost naturally. For the pre-assembly, we moved the two of them together in place. So the assembly of the central truss is no more complex than that. As the scarf joints that we carved previously and we redefined in the workshop, it's just a matter of bringing them, bring out our telehander uh, just to help us carry it in position. And then we can secure it uh, with two wedges. And of course, pre-fitting and more testing is essential to avoid surprises in sight. From this point, things just get easier. The assembly of truss tree is simple, but requires an extra level of caution, not to forget about a loose compression member, like this one, uh, that needs to be installed simultaneously, uh, because this is, this is essential for the continuity of the forces that go from the truss to the glue limb. Also, as you can see, we need to pass our working height security course. Installing truss one, Ergo is, is, is the same, follows the same logic. Don't forget your compression member. Um, I think it's important uh, to highlight that we develop a structural system that could easily be deployed on site. Each axis, axis was broken down into main pre-assembled entities. We also verified and redefined the workflow of assembly over constant dialogue and rehearse with our supporting staff. Well, in this image, like truss, like the axis A and the axis D are real life, and the other three are added digitally. 
But well, A and D, we put them together, like the two axes, from Monday morning to Wednesday afternoon, or the other way around. But basically, we're two days, and we were very happy, like with the result of the modular system that we created and how it works when assembling, because it's really comforting to see how how fast things go together once that they are like practiced and fitted correctly. And now we will show you like some images of the final assembly. This was all in December. And well, uh, there we could see the two dinosaurs <laughs> assumed to the stamp and the key that connects to a fork, the Glulam A3 and the connections to a Glulam to the fork and the trusses, assumed to the trusses and the hardwood insert that pops out. There you can see it as well. But it was really nice because we had two wonderful days, sunny days. We could took pictures with shadows and enjoy it for, for a bit. There, even in the night, we returned to campus to take some photos <laughs> with the stars. We were like totally amazed with, with seeing them there. We're here. We had we, our, our pre-jury yeah. rehearsal. <laughs> so it was the first time the lecture hall actually held a, a meeting. Yeah. <laughs> There we I, are. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are the three of us. Also, Macy and James appear in the picture that they helped us a lot these last four months. They are MSc students and <laughs> continue engaged with Hook. And there are the three of us and the forest behind our, our home. <laughs> so, well, that's all. Thank you very much. Now we'll switch the lecture hall to cinema mode, allowing you to enjoy a, a video that we prepared uh, to give you like a more immersive inside look at our experience and how this crazy madness went. <laughs>
Yeah, we somehow need to, we know it's a lot of information and we, we want to wrap it up with some more personal comments about it. Please wait for us 30 seconds. Yeah, this final presentation is like more the takeaway of each of us from these 16 months. And like it's a mini reflection on the highlights or what of the program or of the project we take with us for life and for our future. So basically we aim to initiate a conversation on the resourcefulness of inheriting design and make as a methodology to foster a more responsible and adaptive approach to architecture. We have demonstrated our commitment through this ethos by undertaking the challenge of exclusively using wood in various stages and forms. This achievement is a result of our profound comprehension of the material and mastery of manufacturing techniques. Adopting a design and build methodology that embraces the latest digital technologies offers numerous advantages. It's a direct path to having more control over the information related to a project and to the possibilities of integrating any local material available to build. Consequently, there can be a reduction of material waste. Have a better planning on the entire process and reduce the risk of each state. This should be intrinsic to every project, but are crucial if you wish to address non-standard and conventional scenarios and complex social iterations. We know that climate change is pushing every sector of the industry to ser uh, and services to be more efficient to be more aware of the impact they have through their processes and products. I think architecture should also adapt to, uh, adapt to nature and to our environment. And the reason why, it's simple. Now we have the technology and the knowledge to do it without any extra cost, with, uh, with less waste and transportation. More, more resourceful buildings have a lower carbon footprint. Now, we have an easy access to tools that allow us to actively engage in material production shaping components that are in intrinsically informed by the method of production and the material behavior. The design and make methodology can be applied to many non-standard natural materials such as round wood, clay, stones, and straw. The limit is the research and collective knowledge put into it. If climate change is so inevitable that we're having COPs to facilitate intergovernmental inter inter climate change negotiations, why architects are not investing more time and effort in making things differently? We can start a revolution if we invest time to include others in a conversation about spatial quality and the impact of construction in the environment. Architects know already uh, that we must be more responsible to adapt to what nature provides. Even if it seems to be a clear opposite way to the current capitalist model, obviously ruled by industries, uh, that are determining how we should architect, uh, do architecture in catalogs, the important fact is to understand why should we go against it. For me, it's not only to be more resilient, but also to give to society that that only architects can provide, that is spatial justice. Or, if you prefer, simply because now we have the technology to do it. If I should pick one aspect of the process as a takeaway, it would be the emphasis on initiating the design journey from the heart of the forest, understanding the natural environment from which the material originates, and understanding its behavior in its untouched state is vital. I think that we should take advantage of the shapes given by nature. Next. Trees had already done lots of the design job, so it's a must to contemplate how they work in, in the natural environment for our designs. This approach not only enhances efficiency, but also establishes a symbiotic relationship with the forest itself, creating a more harmonious and responsible design process. When we get into the weft of the forest, opening our senses and receptors, our mind is free to wander without constraints or boundaries, producing a limitless and omnidirectional contemplation of it. And I believe that nature is wise and it's crucial to observe and understand how it operates in order to later apply it when shaping architectural spaces. Furthermore, these natural forms embed invaluable elements such as strength, the organic curves and the biophilic essence, 
and witnessing these features incorporated into a building allows for a profound connection when leaving the space as one feels like transported to the environment of the forest. The vertical strength inherit like inherent in, in the roundwood forks serving as columns exemplifies the potential of nature inspired design. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, that's the three of us. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, Hook Park has transformed me, like living and integrating myself into the ecosystem at Hook Park has been a profound experience. Over the past 16 months, or less, this journey with my close-knit Hook family has been truly beautiful. Cherishing every interaction, conversation, and insight gained from incred incredibly talented individuals here. Before coming to Hook, I lacked experience in a hands-on craftsmanship or engaging in conversations with professionals from related industries, and I felt confined within the architecture community. And here at Hook, we've immersed ourselves into the intricacies of the UK's forestry, dwelling into the process of utilizing resources from our woodland. We've actively engaged with experts, fabricators, and, and leverage a variety of resources at Hook access to the fully equipped workshop with all the tools we need, robotic manufacturing and CNC technology. While I'm not an expert at the moment, but I've acquired considerable insights into the world of crafting. And now I've learned to understand how through the act of making, design decisions can be influenced and add value to the project. As an international individual, to return home would mean I would be presented to unique challenges uh, posed by the diverse sites, climates, and resources available to me. So I'm driven to turn these differences into opportunities and striving to enhance the sustainability and efficiency of construction as a maker. The knowledge I've acquired from the hands-on practices at Hook inspire me to explore forestry and deepen my understanding as of the wood industry and the logistics back home. And I aim to engage with experts in the field, fostering a dialogue with other relevant professionals who can share valuable insights and perspectives. My aspiration is to approach this endeavor without inhibition shedding any ego and eagerly embracing the opportunity to learn and comprehend with and comprehend my role as an architect with new learned knowledge and understanding of making i get to unlock a multitude of possibilities enabling me as a designer to integrate local materials and resources tailored to the distinct conditions of each site and my ultimate goal is to judiciously utilize available resources, minimize material waste, and implement refined and sustainable installation processes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks so much for that. Um, amazing presentation, amazing project. Um, I, yeah, I was quite blown away. Um, it's, it, first of all, just to say, it's amazing the, um, the care and detail uh, of both the analysis and also the output and the level of detail that you go into to understand exactly the material you're working with and, um, and you know, it's really nice also to hear from that sort of genesis to the conclusion that you all had from the project, which was, um, you know, they stem from very personal goals, but also to think about the role of architects and designers in the industry, how we view use of materials, um, and especially, you know, recycling materials or in, enlarging the industry's view of what is usable. So that's an amazing um, contribution almost that you guys are making to the industry. 
Um, I had a sort of bit more, you know, from that wider observation, just a few more kind of very um, more drilled down uh, questions, really. Um, one of which is just, um, you know, you talk about sort of really understanding the behaviors of trees. Nature's doing a lot for you already. It's, it's, you, can, you can see it operating in ways that, you know, we uh, take years to kind of think of. Um, I wonder how, what, what, there's a sort of two questions really. First of all, what was the sort of observation and evaluation process for finding and almost documenting or evaluating those original, original like found materials? So like what would you class as a viable, suitable material to be used as a column or as a, 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 a compression uh, truss or a, you know, a tension truss? And then I wonder if the second question to that is what other things were maybe discussed that weren't viable? Maybe it's a, a, a trunk to stem or a trunk to branch connection that you just try to use from a found tree, but it just didn't take the force or, you know, I wonder if you can elaborate a bit more on that and whether or not this is the sort of end of the journey or whether there's like many more aspects to the existing trees that you didn't get to use. Yeah, to, to the first one, the first question, I think we we mentioned it in the first presentation. Sorry, there yeah, was an sorry, introduction. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> but but it's good to talk about that. Um, we totally uh, uh, align ourselves and the project to the specific location, and that included the forestry plan. So in our year, there wasn't a massive felling program. So we work with uh, the trees that were felled years before. That was cedar, for example, mainly stumps. Oh, coincidence. And then uh, there was a possibility to fell uh, beech trees because of different conditions. We can ask Chris, that is in the back. But um, not all of them. So we actually went into long walks in the forest to select the ones that we needed. No? And the other uh, source of wood was the one that was already in the seasonal shelter that we have. So we knew that if we wanted to achieve a build of cer certain scale, we needed to work with what we have. And in, that, in a way, that made the project very real to us. No? So what can we get from the forest in, in raw right now? What can we get from the seasonal shelter? And what can we get from lying there in the ground in the forest? And we adapt each main component to work in the best scenario possible, like the relation that has the beech tree with the cedar stump. Basically, cedar is more, more resistant to humidity, et cetera, et cetera. That, that was the logic. I think you have to mm -hmm. carry on with that. Um, 16th and 17th century, the Royal Navy had a program for identifying uh, tree branches, which would then be used in ship construction. You all three talked about um, your reflection and how you go on. So how would you, is there a knowledge that you can pass on to other people on how you select, for example, the opt optimum geometry for a branch, what different branch geometries, what strengths and weaknesses they have? Is it, you talked about photogrammetry, but I think that would, did you, that was already done, right? Or not? Different. You did that? Yeah. Okay. Well, so how did you... So like the branches, in per, like uh, for the, uh, the compression webs, for example, like were retrieved from the felled tree. So the column which was used uh, from the tree, the branches we picked, like we looked at what... We had a rough uh, like diameter that we wanted. So we cut some parts of the tree branches and yeah. then we scanned them. Okay, I, I understand the process, and yeah. you, you were brilliant at presenting, <laughs> and it was amazing, the presentation. But if you're passing on to other people, or you're going back to your country, or to different countries where the, you're working with different timbers, mm -hmm. how can you abstract, Do you have you thought about how you can mm -hmm. abstract the principles, not just the diameter, but the curvatures mm -hmm. of the branch? Yeah. yeah, actually we, at the beginning, we didn't know, knew how to do any of this. So uh, I think the most honest thing to do is just to acknowledge the new species material in wherever you are 
and know that you're going to need to test uh, the local particularities, uh, no? depending on what you need. We also included from uh, the major prototype of the array some design restrictions like uh, angles and distances from the branches. So then we have that included in the system. And that could be general rules for design with tree forks, for example. No, like you don't want to the brand, the distance between uh, points of branches in the plane that you create for having control of it to be wider than one meter, for example. Why? Because you're asking too much of the uh, for for the joint of the tree fork to resist. No, let's keep it in from one meter to lower. And um, those kind of of uh, instructions we we actually wrote them down in the wireframe before we went into the forest to collect. But we, we wouldn't be able to do that if, uh, if we wouldn't have to do the prototype in one-on-one -on -one scale. So again, the holistic spiral uh, methodology of learning and doing, it's very, very essential. And I think that we also like started like sort of conversation w with the forest because, for example, when selecting the forks for the columns, if you analyze a fork and apply pressure to it, it's going to be splitted in this part. So we created the glue lamp to reinforce it and make it to uh, work all together. And also in the forest, if you see the trees are always developed like vertically, but here in our, bu in our building, we wanted the, the trusses, the system of trusses that works horizontally. So by mixing the engineered with the natural, I think that we also push the, the limits of the forest itself. The forest also connects horizontally in the, in the underground, but not something that we can see very much. No, but, but as you said, like conversation, like this was our site, this was our source, and like this was what we had um, the choice of selection. But as you, when you ask, like, what would I take from this? I feel like I don't think I can, like, just straight away take. Like this is not the only way. Like I, can't, I don't think we can tell people that this is the way. But I would like assess that particular situation and talk to people about like from from the industry who know better and like and understand because I'm sure like what like uh, Chris knows about Hook Park and like I mean we don't know like the entire world and like, so I feel like we should not feel like that we know everything and we should just start a dialogue. And with that, with what you know, like you move forward. Yeah. You're not leaving with empty pockets. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Um, I just like to echo, I think it's a beautiful project and its research kind of spans a lot of different interests and, and realms. Um, which, are, which I share, and I'm sure a lot of people share in this room. I, just going on from, from the previous questions and this idea of um, decision making and kind of live feedback as you kind of encounter each problem or you encounter uh, each constraint. I just wonder with, um, you've got a number of different elements that you've kind of interrogated, um, but then you've assembled it as a system. Um, and the final point is the similar, and you, you, you've done two out of the, like the five that we'll go through. I was just wondering, as you assemble the next one, who, who or whoever you kind of hand that baton on to, um, what types of feedback you will be doing as a, as a system? And also the kind of second question to that is like, you've built look, components in, in kind of You've got two big trusses, but you've done a number of things more than once now. I'm just wondering how, what type of feedback and, and how fast and how more efficient you, you were with the second one, or you know, which one's your favorite truss kind of question. Um, and, and is that what type of, is that, are you guys all involved in the, the next three and how will you kind of, kind of continue that? kind of spirit of, of learning and feedback and, and decision making going forward. 
well the the manual that some of you have with you it's a little bit that like an explanation for the future ones to know how the system works and how each element uh, some of them like need more in-depth analysis but the idea of the manual is to to hand in this for the next ones but also like the forks for example are all already selected like the web members are all done like we, we have like more elements produced than just the two axes. But yeah, in the process, like for example, in the glue lamps, it's gonna be necessary to hand it to other ones to, to produce them. And yeah, there are like some decisions, like for example, when you select a plank, try to not have like a big knot or things like that. Um, yeah, we, we, we would love to do like two or three more of these manuals, yeah. just to talk about the I don't know, the tips and the, the be careful bits of it. Um, I think we learned a lot from the first, that first one took how long? Like many months. Yeah. The second one with the half of the people involved uh, took one month. And, uh, and it's important to say that if in the first one we were learning by doing, in the second one, we were polishing processes, and I hope when the third one, the fourth one, it's uh, it's the same. No, so we actually calculated how many, how much time we need for finish the other three, and it's only two months. No, with the tools that we have available. Again, it's no, we are not a, a manufacturing industry assembly <laughs> process table. We are humans uh, that love what they're doing and uh, that are willing to invest time on, on, on this. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's part of the learning curve and, and it's part of the information knowledge that we are passing currently to the new cohort. The first time they arrive, we, we actually invite them all, sit down and already tell them about all the project. Not in a fancy way, like this doesn't work, this work, this break, this, no? Because that's the real life, no? And we wanted them to have, uh, to start like already three, four months in advance from the point that we started. Because I think part of what we do in the sun and make is that, is transfer knowledge into new generations. Because it's only good for everybody that uh, somebody ends up with a better solution for any of these connections, no? But yeah, I think it's intrinsic in, in our work. Sorry, and the, the, a quick follow-up question on that. It's just in terms of the, and it was one of the last slides that you, you were talking about, kind of this move towards digital fabrication. Where, where did this sit within maybe your own expectations of how manual some of these processes had to become or to, to finish off or even just the whole element needed uh, that kind of manual touch um, as opposed to it being kind of fully digitalized? Because obviously, as you learn, as you go along, there everything has constraints, and and is it is our ambition it becomes more digitalized as as it as it progresses, or is it kind of sit as a really kind of a nice balance between the two? I think on your timeline, you call it digital craft. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it was a balance because sometimes you get caught up even in digitally, like trying to. Uh, like solve everything digitally, like to finish the product digitally. But sometimes you end up spending more time to resolve digitally than to actually just finish yeah. to finish it by hand. So I think it's just understanding that and yeah. 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 I think that's also a question of depending where you are, you no, know, and what what are the, uh, your resources. Uh, Im important thing is to acknowledge that all the digital tools are just tools. There's nothing in, in any of the presentation that we couldn't do without the robot or the CNC machine. Those are just tools that improve efficiency. That's it. And so we, we don't depend on technology. We create synergies with technology. But we just do that because we already learned how to craft by hand. So we know the limits of the machine. We know the limits of the curve that we can design and the fibers of the wood can resist. And that's the beauty of, of, of this process. That sounds like an ideology. It is. And it there's is. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. And you, you, you should be 
Like strong, <coughs> stronger about it. Like digital craft, don't you? Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask a, a final question about tolerance. So I notice some joints are open and you know, bigger in there. But also to frame that in a way by how much, or have you thought about how much this will move over its lifetime? So when we look at ancient timber structures, there's quite a lot of deformation, which doesn't always come from load. It comes from changes in humidity over time as the timber ages. Mm -hmm. so, are there studies on that or are thoughts mean, on that? I mean, <laughs> the, the axis D, it's, it's already moved yeah. and, and a lot. And it was very nice to see that it was already split in for the fork, for example, uh, mostly in the relief cut that we made. So it was like, oh, this works, step one. Step two, we scan it to see that, like, oh, this, is this critical? Or actually the joints the, the, are able to absorb this, no? Because the fork was wet and the yeah. glue lamp was dry, no? Um, but I think consciously or unconsciously, we, with the decision making that we did through the process, the glue lamp is not going to move that much as the fork, but the fork can relieve the tension through all the other aspects, but the critical two points that need to be connected are going to remain there. So that's also part of the learning by, I don't know, breaking and no, because <laughs> we were very worried about that, um, uh, but it's part of wood, no, it's, it's part of the material. Um, that's why we, we knew that first prototypes, second prototypes, third prototypes, and then we put a, a, a couple of pieces in the kiln just to push it, uh, no, like give it a kick of, of temperature and humidity. And, and through that, that's why we haven't finished five axes. Because we're doing it with, with care and more conscious like, uh, time, knowing that it's not a, like a pavilion that then we can turn down. AA is gonna no, like, feel bad about us if this doesn't work as an actual structure of building. And, and we took our time and, and we're very happy with that. But, but yeah, it's included the movement and it's gonna keep moving probably. Yeah. But, but yeah. also the fact that um, like the robot did not finish like the fork uh, scarf giant uh, that's meeting the glue lamp completely. Like, so it was oh, yeah. the rough cuts. So we still have to finish the cut with the jig. So we still have room of error. And like when the connection's being made, like we can adjust the jig or make changes to it and, you know, make the right fit uh, in terms of precision. So I think that was a good, it was not intentional in the beginning, but I think it worked, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah, but it's true that the moisture contents will continue varying a lot, and we are now also observers of how that connection between elements is working and how it's reacting to the changes in moisture. <laughs> hey guys, um, thanks so much. Like, just to echo everyone else, it's hard not to be totally dazzled. Mm -hmm. um, by what you're doing and, and you know you've clearly put yourself in the position of the absolute experts in this so it's also quite hard to ask a question in a sense um, but what I really liked was uh, your takeaways mm -hmm. at the end um, and I guess I, I, I can give you kind of my takeaways yeah, from it and maybe like a, it'd be interesting maybe to hear you know your reflections on your own practices from those, I guess, um, first, I guess, is, is the skill and technology of, of it. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not uh, an architect, but I do build my own buildings, and I can see, you know, by hand, and I can see the skill that goes into doing something like that. Um, the second, I guess, is the artistry of it. What you're doing um, in terms of the care for materials, the, you know, the the mastery of small processes, and I guess also the cost of these objects you're creating puts them in a kind of a zone of artworks in a, in a way, for me, but 
as a, you know, as a sculptor, like everything I see is a sculpture. Mm. <laughs> so, if, you know, it feels like you're making sculptures. Um, and I think we're all way beyond any kind of worries about artists or architects. You know, it's an artist teaching at a school of architecture. There's kind of evidence of that. Um, but I'm interested in how that changes you as architects, you know, um, when you're operating as a kind of a sculpt, in a sculptural mode as well, a, a mode of a sculptor, I guess, what, what that is. Um, so I'm interested to hear how, how that changes your practice going forwards. And then I guess the third point is this, just this amazing collaboration, you know, just coming in here, the warmth of this family, as you described it, um, the energy of that, and, and, the, and the web that this collaboration involves, which isn't clearly you, and you've talked about all the other people at Hook, and this, the collaboration that's happened over years. I mean, the fact that you're coming in and adding onto a building, and, you know, the, the kind of the, the um, the lack of ego is amazing yeah. in the sense that you're presenting together and you're not even presenting the whole bit of it. You're going to do a bit and someone's going to do a bit more. Um, I'm fast, I'm, I mean, I'm so impressed by that. I'm so interested in how that is, how you come to that model of collaboration. Like, is there a discussion about that? And whether there is any research at the beginning of like models of collaboration, I'm very interested in systems. So, you know, where that, you know, what that, what those systems are that you're looking at to sort of form a model of collaboration between people with different skills and across sort of time um, as well. And then how that kind of changes your notions of practice going forward. They're pretty wishy-washy ideas and, and questions, but that's my takeaways. And thank you so much. You have anything, to, any thoughts on those? Well, I, I'm, uh, hi. Um, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Chris. Let's First, let's, I. Let's start. Let's play. No, no, no. Let's play. 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 let us play 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 and Francis will hopefully back me up or not back me up. You never know what he's <laughs> going to say next. But Sawn Timber is currently, uh, has a grade to it. Um, and so people know what they're buying. And also there's a grade to species. So if we take Douglas fir, which is an exotic conifer from um, the western seaboard of the, of the States, um, it's usually regarded as a very good structural timber whereas spruce isn't. And again, that's through knowledge that has been built up over the years. And also you can visually grade the timber. In our case, we are dealing with unknown still. We, we are pioneers along with others. And we don't really know what forks are gonna do. And so it's up to us to start somehow grading these forks, not only the geometries, but the species. And we start needing to develop that knowledge with people in the States and elsewhere. Um, because beech is actually not a very strong timber. I can assure you of that. I mean, if I wanted to build something, I wouldn't build it out of beech, I'd build it out of oak. Okay, uh, the forks are much more reliable. Um, so that's all I need to say really on that. So I think it's very important that from now onwards, we, you know, we record this, this data. It's very really critical. So we must start grading trees, if you want, as opposed to sawn timber. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say. Well, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, if I'm being very real, like, I think we got very lucky. Uh, as a cohort uh, that like I want to say and I don't think like everybody uh, get this kind of like I, I see what you're saying about the family but but also I mean 
I should definitely include the fact that how welcoming Hook Park is, though. Like, Hook Park, like, the staff, the the community. Like, it's a small, like, place. It's middle of nowhere. <laughs> like, you're with each other and you're, like... It's like, you're going to see each other all the time. You're around each other all the time. And within that, we have people that nurture us. And, like, and when someone's not doing good, like, we have people that recognize that and like you know they comfort us and and all of that but coming to working as a team also I think like I personally think we got lucky because I've worked in architecture firms before and it doesn't always look like this <laughs> like I mean a lot of egos especially I want to say like architects so like big egos <laughs> and but I feel like maybe is Hook Park too. Like people who choose to be at Hook have this, uh, we are crazy. <laughs> but we also, I think, are compassionate like that. Like I think there's a reason for us being at Hook. Like I don't think everybody can do this. Like, yeah, I, think, and, I, I don't think you've got lucky. I think there's specific conditions that yeah. have made this work. Mm. I think it's really interesting and important to understand those conditions mm. and take those forwards in other situations. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to just be the whole bubble. It mm. could be a, a whole model of collaboration. Yeah, you, you didn't just get lucky because <laughs> year in, year out, the students feel that at Hope Park. And it's not the students, anybody who visits Hope Park. Yeah. Mm. And I, possibly the answer, part of the answer is, is in the joy of making itself mm. and, mm. and seeing that so much more is achieved by the collaboration than by you as an individual. Mm. Maybe that's it um, that takes the ego out of it. So <laughs> you do something great, but then you see yeah. it's even greater when someone else is. I, I don't know, but but it's but it's not like it's. I mean, of, of course, this it's not always perfect, but 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 it's amazing what is achievable down there. And possibly the secret you're looking for maybe that people should make things more together, not just design things more together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's very well said. Yeah. The, the only other point I wanted to quickly make is that this thing's called a Warren Truss. Okay, you start if you start the year. It, I worked for 28 years as a structural engineer with with lots of very well known <laughs> architects and architects with big egos and and, and, and all sorts of stuff. And you know, Warren Truss is a very sort of um, industrial pragmatic structure. You wouldn't normally think that the most beautiful piece of uh, one of the most beautiful pieces of architecture I've experienced in 28 years of working with professions is a Warren Trust made out of wood by amateurs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, Thank you. But that, what that answers is it's care. It, it's had more care in it than anything I've had professionally made. There's more care in this. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll hop onto that and say, you know, I think you guys are in a great place right now seeing it finished, but watching you guys work on it, you know, throughout the year there was quite a lot of stress you were under, so it is really incredible that yeah. collaboration um, and uh, seeing you guys finish this project. Um, one question I had, I, I really enjoy the story of how you guys rehearsed putting glue, the glue lamb process mm. and tried it again and again to make sure you have it down to a timing. Um, and yeah, that sort of per performance of bring, putting this thing together. Um, I'm curious, was there any point in the planning that something didn't go according to plan? And how did you guys um, tackle that? <laughs> yeah, every time there, there was an error. And if you see the one that is here also has errors in order to improve the process afterwards, like a piece already came out in that glue lamp that we have over there. But also between the team there were errors because we were like with glue in our hands and suddenly like passing over another one, glue in the hair, and afterwards it was a whole mess in the bathroom with all the hair, like, uh, yeah, that kind of things happen a lot. I, I have pictures of that as well, like taking out our clothes and suddenly like, yeah. But yeah, like as, as every process is of try and error, and but Hook Park is also a place for that. It's experimental and it's super fun too to explore. <laughs> Very dangerous, they gave me the microphone. But, um, <laughs> no, I wanted to say it was, it's been interesting for me because I got to see this project at several points through. And actually what I wanted to mention is almost not the piece because I guess I got to see it so recently there. True. But 
the the level of your storytelling has gone com complete. It's just so much better. Like, and I know you had less of the story to tell before, but I have to say, I think when one of the times we, we were talking a while ago was on, it, like almost improving telling the story, and I have to say this was brilliant. This was mm -hmm. this was a, a level above what I saw before by by a lot, and it b became clearer and more heartfelt somehow simultaneously, which I think is like a real testament that may, maybe it's because you're seeing the end. Um, but I thought that that's one thing I wanted to say because I thought it was it was really great. Um, I had two questions, I guess. One is, did you forget a compression member at some point? Because that's why we put Yes. Yes, I, thought, I, lo I love that very much. That was, uh, that, that's why the manual statifies, don't forget your compression <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, The other thing I wondered as you're wrapping up is, any thought about when it's disassembled? Because it will be one day. And will I find inside it somewhere your names? Or uh, that's that's for you to to find out later. But I think there are personal craft marks all over the pieces, not necessarily names. I am pretty sure we can recognize our our involvement in that. It was yeah, it's it's part of it. As I, I think it was mentioned here, it's. It was the making, the, the love to making and the enjoyment of, the, of making. Like nobody asked us to stay late nights, trying and hammering and gluing. We just did it because we enjoyed the time because we feel like we were learning. We feel like we were part of a collective doing something. We knew that we were achieving something very nice, that we are proud of it. So yeah, it was, was part of it, no? Nice. Great. Um, I'm going to weigh in with the sort of final wrap-up comments. Hello. Um, I've had the fantastic benefit of this being my fifth program over the past three days. And Whoa. it's it's uh, it's a good opportunity to take the overview. Um, I think that over the course of the last few days, there's always been this question of what a thesis is and how you embed a body of knowledge in, in a, a piece of work. And I think there's... There's always been some concerns for me of how you represent research through a piece of design. And I know that I've had the benefit of being down at Hook and having conversations with some of you on the terrace over many months about the nature of intuition, the na nature of resourcefulness, and where this sits within an academic framework, and perhaps even wider within a research level of intention. And I think that the past few days have impressed me with the breadth of thinking, but also there's a tremendous level of kind of hunger and you're having to hold back the enthusiasm, the journey, the narrative, but also a tre tremendous body of knowledge. And that body of knowledge, I think particularly with the way in which you presented, and I know this also comes out of some of the conversations we've had at Hook, of a passion to take that knowledge forward. And I think Mike Weinstock's uh, comments were particularly astute in that they probe a really critical question of what represents I suppose, common knowledge and what is highly specific to the, the specific individual, the specific site. This project has a really interesting crossover in that you speak about it in this highly emotive way. In fact, there was one point where you talk about the, you know, let's not forget the, the hardwood compression member, I think. It sounded a little bit like your Oscars speech, you know? It was like, and I don't want to forget my agent, you know, who's absolutely essential to the process. And, I think this then does beg the question of, and this has come up over the past few days, what is typological, i.e. repetitive or, or represents a kind of a method, an approach, um, a module, and what becomes highly specific, and where does the design process influence that? Because I think the problem we have is when we start to apply research to design processes, is we can make those processes incredibly banal. And I think what you've done here is that you're creating quite a, really, a good match between what is quite an emotional and intuitive and gut kind of response to a situation and the sort of things that need to have the integrity to move forward. I really, the passion has been incredibly positive and I hope you do intend to take this forward. I do think the wrap up comments to reiterate some of the things that other people have been saying are incredibly important. We've spoken a lot about being resourceful, about working um, with a degree of immediacy that comes back to the idea of digital craft um, the overlap between ideas of computational form and uh, the question of labor, mm -hmm. the question of um, ethics within labor. Mm -hmm. 
and the question of ethics within kind of material responses. I think you're touching on all of these in a really incredible way. And um, I think I have a lot more to say, but I know you, you've got the microphone. <laughs> you want to respond, so go ahead. I, I, I just want to mention that this, this past years of the architectural profession of trying to create methodologies and manuals and just that in a very frivolous way, it's just because we are aiming to get away from building and making itself for weird decisions in the past of what was being an architect. But this is what it is because the architects were involved in the making. So that's, I think, makes a difference between the methodology of trying to polish something up to the ultimate detail versus the manual that gives you tips and gives you notes and gives you recommendations, but acknowledge that somebody is going to be there. So we are not aiming to design something so someone else can build it. And that's the main difference between other practices or what, again, the, the late industry is molding as an architect, as, as, an, as an architect, architects gaining back our responsibility and our role and be more involved, that allow us to create this. If we keep just sending pre-approved drawings, yeah. it's not gonna work. And I think that that's part of the discussion of, of our involvement, depending on what's the outcome that we want to have. And if we want to work collaboratively, yeah. or we want to just produce something up to one point and not care about the result. I don't know, it's very wide, but I don't know if but I... But I think there's two aspects. It's one is about immediacy and one is about collectivity. Yes. And I think that, you know, I, I, I've been banging on about this for months now. You know, the history of this school has been one of plurality, but that's been about opposition between positions and opinions. And we are very much into a generation of collectivity, but that means something very specific. Mm -hmm. The third thing is that what you're talking about also is education. There's a continuity between how you pass on knowledge. Mm -hmm. So while the toolkit becomes completely, I suppose, um, overloaded <laughs> as, a, as a methodology, yeah. the passing on of knowledge, whether that's individual to individual, is still a critical way in which you bring forward the things that you've gained. Yeah. There's one last really maybe long comment. When I came here, I think I went to Hook, I met with Kate and Emmanuel very early on, before I was in post, and um, actually I remember saying to you, this course sounds amazing, I wish I could do it, and she said very dryly, well, that would be awkward. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, it would, but it's still, I, I, maybe, you know, maybe when I retire. But, um, yeah, um, Hook is, I mean, it's, it, it sounds like a magical place. It's not an easy place. It's a place of a very small number of people that are living cheek to jowl, often in the very cold, sometimes actually in the summer when the light is really low because the trees, the leaves are on the trees. It's a tough place to be. So as much as it's been wonderful and you paint a wonderful picture, I know and you know and the people who've experienced it, it's not easy. So you've made a fantastic collaboration, but, and that's, you think that's just lucky, but you make your luck in conditions of quite significant adversity. And I think that's part of the grind. With a little bit of rub, actually, you create some things of exceptional beauty. But I think it's credit to you to, this is a complex story. It's a complex narrative that has produced something wonderful, but not with ease. And I think that's definitely part of the, part of the, um, part of the picture. So congratulations. Thank you. I think it was the bigger picture that we kept looking at and that what kept pushing us and motivating us and I think just for us to see like the truss up on site was all we wanted and and I think and, and I think we were just like not even allowing our emotions to like come through and we were just like <laughs> pushing each other just to like achieve that but I think I mean we loved each and every bit of it the process but I think it was the the bigger picture that like really pushed us to uh, go through hardships and like, yeah, yeah, I think it was the bigger picture, yeah. I mean. I just think it's also amazing that, like, Hook is here today, which I think is great. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it, anyone else got any comments, any from the students? Have we got a student, yeah, excellent. Um, I'm just going to touch upon the whole aspect that was discussed at the end. 
by you and uh, here uh, talking about how the collective is coming together and how they're so sensitive about the whole process and the outcome. I think that's how it's given to us by Kate and Emmanuel. They introduce us to all the things, including the robot, the KUKA, they name it. They make it so romantic that it's a part of your community. Like, you know, you are living with them and they become important individuals along with you. Like all these identities and that binds it all together. I think so, yeah. That would be all. <laughs> Okay, um, Iling, Rafa, Snigda, Miguel, we're going to miss you. Um, so, uh, well, actually, actually, then two of them are not leaving. <laughs> um, you, yeah, you're right. No one ever leaves. You're always part of the family. Um, and thank you. Really, really proud of you. And we're proud of everyone coming up today and the Hook family. It's really, really lovely. Thank you. Thank you.